Good afternoon, everyone. Let's get started on tonight's homework. So we are looking at page 114, which is the beginning of chapter 11. And we're going to read just for about five pages tonight. So let's go ahead and flip over to page 114, chapter 11. We do have an annotation task, so be looking at your worksheet as well. It says, as you read, consider the following. How would you characterize Mrs. DeBose? So like what kind of person is she? Be looking for those details. And then what is your opinion of Atticus's actions in this situation? So be annotating what his actions are so then they, later you can decide if you agree with them. So two more things, two things. What type of person is Ms. DeBose and what are Atticus's actions in the situation with Mrs. DeBose? Remember that you do have these words to watch for. If you don't know what they mean, they tell you all about it and give you the page number. All right, let's get started on reading chapter 11. When Jim, when we were small, Jim and I confined our activities to the southern neighborhood, but when I was well into the second grade at school and tormenting Boo Radley became passe, the business section of Maycomb drew us frequently up the street past the real property of Mrs. Henry Lafayette DeBose. It was impossible to go to town without passing her house unless we wished to walk a mile out of the way. Previous minor encounters with her left me with no desire for more, but Jem said I had to grow up sometimes. Mrs. DeBose lived alone except for a Negro girl in constant attendance two doors up the street from us in a house with a steep front steps and a dog trot hall. She was very old. She spent most of each day in bed and the rest of it in a wheelchair. It was rumored that she kept a CSA pistol concealed among her numerous shawls and wraps. Jem and I hated her. If she was on the porch when we passed, we would be raked with her wrathful great gaze, subjected to ruthless interrogation regarding our behavior, and then given a melancholy prediction on what we would amount to when we grew up, which was always nothing. We had long ago given up the idea of walking past her house on the opposite side of the street. That only made her raise her voice and let the whole neighborhood in on it. We could do nothing to please her. If I said as sunnily as I could, hey, Mrs. DeBose, she would, or I would receive as for an answer, don't you say hey to me, you ugly girl. You say good afternoon, Mrs. DeBose. She was vicious. Once she heard Jem refer to our father as Atticus, and her reaction was apoplectic. Besides being the sassiest, most disrespectful mutts who ever passed her way, we were told that it was quite a pity our father had not remarried after our mother's death. A lovelier lady than our mother never lived, she said. And it was heartbreaking the way Atticus Finch let her children run wild. I did not remember our mother, but Jem did, and he would tell me about her sometimes. And he went livid when Mrs. DeBose shot us that message. Jem, having survived Boo Radley, a mad dog, and other terrors, had concluded that it was cowardly to stop at Miss Rachel's front steps and wait, and decreed that we must run as far as the post office corner each evening to meet Atticus coming from work. Countless evenings Atticus would find Jem furious at something Mrs. DeBose had said when we went by. Easy does it, son, Atticus would say. She's an old lady, and she's ill which is means sick. You just hold your head high and be a gentleman. Whatever she says to you, it's your job not to let her make you mad. Jem would say she must not be very sick, she hollered so much. When the three of us came to her house, Atticus would sweep off his hat, wave gallantly to her and say, good evening, Mrs. DeBose. You look like a picture this evening. I never heard Atticus say, like a picture of what. He would tell her the courthouse news and would say he hoped with all his heart she'd have a good day tomorrow. He would return his hat to his head, swing me to his shoulders in her very presence, and we would go home in the twilight. It was times like these when I thought my father, turning the page, who hated guns and had never been to any wars, was the bravest man who ever lived. 
The day after Jem's 12th birthday, his money was burning up his pockets, so we headed to for town in the early afternoon. Jem thought he had enough to buy a miniature steam engine for himself and a twirling baton for me. I had long had my eye on that baton. It was at V.J. Elmore's. It was bedecked with sequins and tinsel. It cost 17 cents. It was then my burning ambition to grow up and twirl with the Maycomb County High School Band. Having developed my talent to where I could throw up a stick and almost catch it coming down, I had caused Calpurnia to deny me entrance to the house every time she saw me with a stick in my hand. I felt that I could overcome this effect with a real baton, and I thought it generous of Jim to buy one for me. Mrs. DeBose was stationed on her porch when we went by. Where are you two going at this time of day? She shouted. Playing hooky, I suppose? I'll just call up the principal and tell him. She put up her hands on the wheels of her chair and executed a perfect right face. Oh, it's Saturday, Mrs. DeBose, said Jem. Makes no difference if it's Saturday, she said obscurely. I wonder if your father knows where you are. Mrs. DeBose, we've been going to town by ourselves since we were this high. Jem placed his hand palm down about two feet above the sidewalk. Don't you lie to me, she yelled. Jeremy Finch, Maudie Atkinson told me you broke down her scrupernog arbor this morning. She's going to tell your father, and you'll wish you never saw the light of day. If you aren't sent to the reform school before next week, my name's not the Bows. Jem, who had been near Miss Maudie a scuppernog arbor since last summer, and who knew Miss Maudie wouldn't tell Atticus if he had, issued a general denial. Don't you contradict me, Mrs. DeBose bawled. And you, she pointed an arthritic figure, finger at me. What are you doing in those overalls? You should be in a dress and a camisole, young lady. You'll grow up waiting on tables if somebody doesn't change your ways. A finch waiting on tables at the OK Cafe. Ha! I was terrified. The OK Cafe was a dim organization on the north side of the square. I grabbed Jem's hand, but he shook me loose. Come on, Scout, he whispered. Don't pay any attention to her. You just hold your head high and, and be a gentleman. But Mrs. DeBose held us. Not only a finch waiting on tables, but one in the courthouse lying for ends. Jem stiffened. Mrs. DeBose's shot had gone home and she knew it. Yes, indeed. What has this world come to when a finch goes against his raising? I'll tell you. She put her hand to her mouth and then she drew it away. It trailed a long sliver of thread of saliva. Your father's no better than the end and trash he works for. Jem was scarlet as he turned red. I pulled at his sleeve and we were followed up the sidewalk by a philippicic Philippic on our family's moral degradation, or dead, sorry, these are hard words, dead generation. And the major premise of what was what the half of the finches were in the asylum anyway. But if our mother were living, we would not have come to such a state. I wasn't sure what Jim resented most, but I took umbrage at Mrs. DeBose's assessment of the family's mental hygiene. I had become almost accustomed to hearing insults aimed at Atticus. But this was the first one coming from an adult. Except for her remarks about Atticus, Mrs. DeBose's attack was only routine. There was a hint of summer in the air. In the shadows it was cool, but the sun was warm, which meant good times coming. No school and dill. Jem bought his steam engine and we went by Elmore's for my baton. Jem took no pleasure in his acquisition. He jammed it in his pocket and walked silently beside me toward home. On the way home, I nearly hit Mr. Link Dees, who said, Oh, look out, Scout, now, Scout, when I missed a toss, and we approached Mrs. DeBose's house. My baton was grimy from having picked it up out of the dirt so many times. Whew, she was not on the porch. In later years, I sometimes wondered exactly what made Jem do it. What made him break the bonds of, You just be a gentleman, son and the phase of self-conscious rectitude he had recently entered. Jem had probably stood as much gruff about Atticus lying for ends as had I, and I took it for granted that he kept his temper. He had a natural, tranquil disposition and a slow fuse. At the time, however, 
I thought the only explanation for what he did was that for a few minutes, he simply went mad. Jim, or what Jim did, was something I'd do as a matter of course, or of course, I had not been under Atticus's indirect, but, or which I assumed included not fighting horrible old ladies. We had just come to her gate when Jem snatched my baton and ran, flailing wildly up the steps to Mrs. DeBose's front yard, forgetting everything Atticus had said, forgetting that she packed a pistol under her shawls, forgetting that if Mrs. DeBose missed, her girl Jessie probably wouldn't. He did not begin to calm down until he had cut the tops off every camellia bush Mrs. DeBose owned flowers until the ground was littered with green buds and leaves. He bent my baton against his knee, snapped it in two, and threw it down. By the time that time, I was shrieking, and Jem yanked my hair. He said, he said he didn't care, and he'd do it again if he got the chance, and if I didn't shut up, he'd pull every hair out of my head. I didn't shut up, and he kicked me. I lost my balance and fell on my face. Jem picked me up roughly and looked like he was sorry, but there was nothing to say. We did not choose to meet Atticus coming home that evening. We skulked around the kitchen until Calpurnia threw us out. By some voodoo system, Calpurnia seemed to know all about it. She was a less than satisfactory source of palliation, but she did give Jem a hot biscuit and butter, which he tore in half and shared with me. It tasted like cotton. We went to the living room. I picked up a football magazine, found a picture of Dixie Howell, showed it to Jem, and said, This looks like you. That was the nicest thing I could think to say to him, but it was no help. He sat by the windows, hunched down in a rocking chair, scowling and waiting. Daylight faded. All right, that's where we're going to pause for today. So remember to be thinking about what kind of person is Mrs. DeBose. And then what is your opinion of Atticus's actions in this situation, um, which we'll learn more about tomorrow as well. Let's take a look at the questions that you'll need to answer. There are only three, so go ahead and get to those. Make sure you use complete sentences, capital letters at the beginning, periods at the end. Have a lovely night.